Hello everybody, this is Dr. Vishal Trivedi from Department of Biosciences and Bioengineering, IIT Guwahati. And today we are uh, going to discuss about the in interaction of the antibodies with the antigen. In the previous uh, lectures, we have discussed how to generate the antibodies. We have discussed about the generation of the polyclonal antibodies and as well as the monoclonal antibody. So, once you have generated the antibody, you have generated the first uh, immunological tool to use it for various purposes. So, one of the purpose of generating an antibody is to study the interaction of the antibody with the antigen. So, let us see how the antibody and antigen actually interact with each other and how that can be exploited to design different types of experiments or different types of tools to, uh, to, uh, to study the, uh, the various biological processes. So, as you can see that you have an antibody and then you have an antigen. This antigen could be composed of one or more uh, epitopic regions. For example, in this case we have the six epitopic regions like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and 6 and what you can see is all these epitopic regions are actually uh, uh, producing the antibodies or all these epitopic regions are antigenic in nature. So, they are actually producing the antibodies and all these antibodies are exclusive to this epitopic region which means the antibody and antigens are actually forming a cognate pair where a antibody is exclusive to a particular antigen specifically uh, antibody is specific to that particular epitopic region which means if you have the antibody uh, for the epitopic region 6, it is actually going to recognize this particular epitope and uh, as a global it is also going to allow you to recognize the, uh, the antigen as well. So, why the antigen and antibodies are forming the uh, cognate pair because they are actually working on the exclusive recognition principles where you have the exclusive determinants which are allowing the antigen and the antibodies to interact with each other and that in that interaction is very very specific and exclusive. Now, let us see that you have an uh, antibody and then you have an antigen and how and why it is actually uh, ha having the uh, exclusive interactions or exclusive specificity because the antigen is made up of, of a three dimensional structure. So, that is you, you have a three dimensional structure which is comprised of the antibody and what you can see is that it can actually allow the antigens to interact and the antigens which are actually mapping with the similar kind of three dimensional structures are actually being allowed to interact with the antibodies. In addition to that, the antibodies are also providing the various uh, sp uh, spaces where they are actually going to provide the either the site for the electrostatic interaction or the hydrophobic interactions. For example, in this case, this site is actually having a uh, a, a positively charged residue. So, what will happen is it actually will allow the antigen to have a negatively charged residue. So, even the three dimensional structure of a antibody as well as the antigen is matching, but the positive residues which are present in this site is not getting a negative residue present on the antigen. It is not actually allowing this ant particular antigen to bind, which means there could be multiple antigens which are actually may be forming that similar kind of three dimensional structures. Uh, but until unless this interaction is not going to be satisfied, uh, the antibody is not going to recognize the antigen to form the stable complex. Similarly, you have a site for the hydrogen bonding. So, the antibody could be a hydrogen donor. That is why it is actually looking for an hydrogen acceptor on the antigen so that it will be able to form a stable hydrogen bonding. Similarly, you have the groups which are actually being participating into the Van der Waal interactions and on the other hand, it also has the uh, groups which are actually been involved into the 
pi pi stacking interaction so all these interaction as well as the three dimensional structures actually provide the specificity into the antibodies to recognize the antigen or the epitopic region present in the antigen now the antigen antibody interaction could be of multiple types because as you can see that the antigen could be of multiple type multiple uh, types for example antigen could be a insoluble antigens or it could be a soluble antigens so what is mean by the insoluble antigen is that for example the cells like for example you have the rbc so rbc is a antigen which actually is not soluble in the solution which is actually going to form a particulate matter for example if you keep the rbc into the any buffer it is actually going to settle down so that is that is why it is falling under the category of the insoluble antigens the other molecules which are also insoluble are like virus or some of the bacteria also are falling under the insoluble antigens soluble antigens are mostly the proteinaceous uh, substances like proteins or the uh, dna or the rna and and, and sometimes also the lipids so the molecules which are soluble in aqueous media are falling under the soluble antigens so if the antigen is insoluble it is actually going to interact with antibodies and will participate into the agglutination reactions agglutination reactions are the reactions where the antibody is going to interact with the in, uh, antigen and it is actually going to form a, a network or the mesh because of that it is actually going to clump it is going to clump all the uh, ant uh, antigen containing uh, uh, particulate antigens whereas if the antigen is soluble in nature it is going to interact with the antibodies and in a process it antibodies are going to precipitate the antigen from the vicinity the classical example in the precipitation reactions are the radial immunodiffusion assay as well as the immunoprecipitations and apart from the antigen antibody interaction which are participating into the agglutination reaction or the precipitation reactions antigen antibody interaction is also responsible for development of different types of immuno assay such as the elisa ria or the western blotting so in today's lecture we are actually going to discuss most of these uh, techniques and then we will like also going to see how these technique can be utilized to solve the some of the scientific problems agglutination reactions so agglutination is the process of linking together of antigens by the antibodies and the formation of visible aggregates the agglutination reaction involves the particulate antigens such as the bacteria viruses or the rbc the agglutination reaction is very sensitive and the it is very reproducible do you can have two different types of agglutination reactions you can have the direct agglutination reactions or you can have the indirect agglutination reactions in the direct agglutination reactions you are actually going to use the antigen as such whereas the indirect agglutination reactions you are actually going to have the antigens which are actually going to coupled to a uh, a bead or some uh, support media so that it is actually going to form the particulate antigen which means if the antigen is soluble you can make it to insoluble simply by coupling it to a latex beads or amine beads or some cell so that it becomes the insoluble and then you can be able to perform the aid in direct agglutination reactions so in the direct agglutination reactions the direct agglutination reaction test the test diagnosis the antibodies against a large number of cellular antigens such as the rbcs bacteria and fungi this test is carried out in a plastic microtiter plate that have several small shallow wells the formation of the antibody antigen mat which sinks to the bottom of the well however in the negative reactions the agglutination reaction does not occur and the insufficient antibodies are present to cause the linking of the antigens so what will happen is when you have a antigen which is a 
insoluble antigen when you are adding the antibodies the antibodies are binding to this antigen but it is actually not causing the agglutination reactions because they are not been able to cross linked or clumped because the other antibody is missing but as soon as you add the anti igg antibody which is actually going to cross link the antibody which is attached to the antigen what will happen is all these antigens are going to be form a network and because of that it is actually going to form a, a aggregate and that aggregate is going to be visible through the naked eye and that is how it is going to have the agglutination reactions. In, in the negative reactions the agglutination reaction will not occur and that is why why it is not happen because you do not have the sufficient quantity of the antibodies which is not available to link the antigens. So, be, until unless the you do not have the sufficient quantity of anti, antibodies the antigens are not going to be linked together to form a mesh or the mat like conditions and that is how it is actually not going to give you the agglutination reactions. What you can see is uh, if you take the uh, for example, if you take the RBCs and if you add the antibodies. So, what will happen is all these RBCs are actually going to be connected by a small uh, antibodies through, ne through a network of antibodies and because of that all these antibodies are going to clump and they will going to show you a aggregate. Whereas, in the in the negative control where you are not going to add the antibodies there will be no sufficient clumping. So, that is why what you see is actually a RBC pellet. So, this is not actually a agglutination reactions uh, whereas, in this case or in this case you have the larger pellet and it is actually uh, going to show you a mesh kind of network because of that it is actually different from this. And, uh, so, this is this is a very very uh, sensitive re uh, reactions or sensitive ex uh, uh, reactions where you can be visually visually you can be able to check whether the agglutination reaction is happening or not. Uh, one of the classical example where you are actually using the agglutination reaction is the blood group typing. So, blood group you know that the human has the four blood group A, B, A, B and O and all these blood groups are being classified by the reaction of the RBCs with the antibodies. So, what you can do is that the blood group typing is accomplished by mixing a drop of blood with a serum containing antibodies against the uh, ABO and the RH system. So, what you what you in the experiment what you are going to do is you take a drop of blood and then you mix it with the anti A or with anti B antibody. So, anti A is a antibody which is for the antigen A whereas, the anti B is the antibody which is against the antigen B. So, what will happen is you have taken a RBC now you have added the those two sera and then you mix them into a slide and then you look for the agglutination reactions. So, what will happen is if you have the anti A antibody and anti B antibody what will happen is if there will be a positive agglutination reaction with a anti A antibody, but there is a negative agglutination reaction with anti B antibodies then the blood group is going to be A. Similarly, if the agglutination reaction is negative for anti A, but it is positive for anti B then you are going to have the uh, B blood group. Now, if you have the blood group anti A and anti B if the both antibodies are giving you the agglutination reaction then the blood group is going to be A B. Whereas, if you are not getting the agglutination reaction for anti A or anti B then you are going to have the blood group O and for detecting whether it is a, a is it, it is a positive or the negative you can actually also do uh, another reaction where you can add the anti D antibodies which are actually recognizing the RH factor. So, if the anti D is negative then it is RH if anti D is positive then it is actually RH positive if anti D is negative then it is called as the Rh negative. 
So by doing this kind of analysis and by just by simply doing the three reactions where you are going to add the blood drop with anti A, anti B and anti D antibodies, you will be able to identify and you will be able to classify a person with its blood group either it will be A positive, B positive or AB or O positive. Uh, these blood groups are, uh, uh, so uh, I have given you a link uh, in case you are interested to see all these reactions because, uh, because uh, you can be able to see visually how the reactions of the blood when it is mixed with the antisera is uh, ha happening. So you can just follow this link and it will actually going to give you the real experience of how this agglutination reaction actually look like. Now indirect agglutination reactions. So indirect agglutination reaction is a adaptation of soluble antigen for performing the agglutination reaction. As you can see that the agglutination reactions are only being done if the antigen is insoluble nature which means it is actually going to be a particulate in nature. But in some cases suppose the antigen is soluble in nature but you would like to do the agglutination reactions because the the one of the major advantage of agglutination reaction is that it is actually does not require a very expensive infrastructure because what you can actually do is you just simply add the antibodies and then you wait for some time and then you will be able to visually see whether you are getting the uh, clump of that particular cell or not or uh, the clump of the antigen or not and that is visually uh, you can see in comparison to that if you perform any other immunological assay like ELISA, RIA or radio immunoassay or any other assay it sometimes it, uh, it is actually requires more infrastructure number one. Number two it requires the specific spectrophotometer so that you will be able to see the readouts from the ELISA or RIA or, uh, or the, uh, uh, or the uh, uh, immunodeficient assays. And in some time if you want to do uh, immunoelectrophoresis then it is also require the infrastructure whereas the agglutination reaction does not require the extensive or expensive infrastructures number one. Number two it is easy to perform you just add the antibodies and it is work. So that is why people are trying to develop the agglutination reactions even for all those antigens which are not insoluble but which are soluble in nature which means you can actually have the proteins which is soluble in nature and you can be able to perform the agglutination reaction simply by performing the indirect agglutination reactions. So this is the adaptation of soluble antigen for the agglutination reactions. In this type of agglutination reactions what you are going to do is you are actually going to take the antigen then you are going to add the beads and you are going to run a coupling reactions. If you remember when we were discussing about the coupling of the antigens to a beads or antigen to a beads to, to prepare the affinity column, you can do simply, simply the similar kind of experiments and you can actually be able to couple the antigen to a bead or some spherical object so that it is actually going to be insoluble in nature and that is how your antigen is going to be tagged to these particular beads. And now your insoluble antigen is ready and then what you can do is you can simply add the antibodies and all these antigens are now going to participate into the agglutination reactions and they are actually going to give you the aggregates. And this type of this is actually a diagnostic text and it is actually allowing the rapid detection of the soluble antigens such as the streptococci which is actually a bacteria. Uh, if the antigens are absor adsorbed onto the particles like RBCs or latex beads the soluble antigens can respond to the agglutination test. See antibody reacts with the soluble antigens adhering to the particles therefore the particles agglutinate with each other as these do not have a direct agglutination test. So the indirect agglutination test is only for those antigens which are soluble in nature but you can actually evolve or develop the agglutination reactions for them for easy diagnosis purpose. 
Now, apart from the agglutination test, you can also do the hem hemagglutination uh, assays or hemagglutination reactions. So, hemagglutination reaction is the phenomena of clumping of RBCs when the RBCs are agglutinated by the certain viruses uh, such as the NDV virus, those causing the mumps, measles or influenza, it, these viruses can be detected simply by the uh, doing performing the hemagglutination reactions. So, in a, in a typical hemagglutination reaction, what you are going to do is you are going to take the RBCs, then you add the viruses and these viruses are actually going to attach to some of the proteins which are present on to the RBC and that is how it, they are actually going to couple them. So, hemagglutination is the linking of red blood cells by the virus particle in an isotonic solution that results in the clumping. The clumped RBCs settle down much slowly as compared to the virus free RBCs. Thus, the untreated RBCs settle down to the bottom of a well and forms a defined red button while in the virus cross linked RBCs no red button is observed. So, what will happen is what you do is you take the RBCs suspended in PBS and then you are actually going to uh, wash it and then you prepare the RBCs and then once your RBCs are ready then you can just add the virus particles and what will happen is the virus is going to uh, cross linked these RBCs and that is how they are actually going to form the uh, the, uh, the aggregates and these aggregates are actually going to show you the uh, uh, particulate uh, pattern compared to that you are actually going to get the settling or down of the RBC which is actually going to give you a smooth uh, pellet where compared to that agglutinated RBCs are going to give you the particulate kind of appearances. So, in a control reaction what you see is that the RBCs are settling down as a smooth RBC button whereas, in the case of the uh, viruses they are not going to give you a button like appearance, but a hazy pattern because all these RBCs are entangled with the virus particles and that is how they will actually going to form a meshwork and these meshworks are not going to give you a smooth uh, button like appearances. How to perform the hemocultation assays? Uh, the material what you required for doing the hemocultation assay is the you require the RBCs, you require the micro tractor plate readers or micro tractor plate, uh, you require the PBS, then you require the micro pipette and tips, you require the conical tubes, then you require the centrifuge with a swinging bucket rotor and you require a bleach solution so that you will be able to disinfect the virus containing articles so that there will be no cross contamination of the viruses to the other objects. In the step 1 you have to prepare the RBCs. So, what you do is you collect 1 to 2 ml of the blood with EDTA so that it uh, which contains the anticoagulant. Then the fresh RBCs should be prepared for this assay because the fresh RBCs are going to have the very high quantity of antigen as well as the fresh RBCs are not going to show any degradation of the antigen which is being expressed on their cell surface. Then you spin the uh, this uh, for 1500 rpm for 10 minutes, carefully remove the white buffy layer which means that you remove the WBCs on the top of the RBC pallet and then remove the serum part. Then you dilute the uh, resulting pellet uh, into PBS and mix it with the inverting. Spin it at 1500 rpm for 10 minutes, discard the supernatant, repeat the wash 3 to 4 times and then you prepare a 1 percent RBC solution using the uh, 1x uh, phosphate buffer saline as a diluent. Once your RBCs are ready then you can actually do the viral dilutions. So, viral dilutions you are going to do as a serial dilution. So, to each well you add the 50 microliter of PBS and then you are going to do a serial dilution of the viruses. So, what you do is you take the uh, viruses first you add the virus into the first sample and then you are actually going to do a serial dilution simply by transferring the viruses from one well to another well and that is how you are actually going to prepare a uh, serial dilution of the virus samples which means you are going to prepare uh, uh, one fold dilutions. 
discard the 50 microliter from the last well into the bleach solutions then you prepare the appropriate positive and negative control the positive control should be from a sample where the virus is already known to be present whereas the negative control would be only to have the rbc and the pbs then you add the 50 microliter of the rbc to all the wells wells the working concentration would be the 0.5 percent rbc's then you mix them gently and close the lid and then keep or incubate them for room temperature for 15 to 30 minutes to develop or to perform the reaction so that if it is going to show you the hemoglobin assay. Ultimately the result what you are going to see is this, this. So what you have done is you have just put the viruses into the different dilutions like 1 is to 1, 1 is to 2, 1 is to 4, 1 is to 8. So it is every time it is diluting into half and ultimately you are going to have the multiple dilutions like up to 1 is to, 1 is to uh, 128. Then in the positive control what you see is that the up to the 1 is to 32 you are actually getting a RBC pellet with a hazy pattern. So what you see is actually a cloudy pattern which is actually a representative uh, with an indication of the hemocrylation assay. Whereas you see this RBC, this is a smooth RBC button that actually is indication of that the hemocrylation assay is not working in this particular concentration. Once the virus concentration will go down to a particular level, then it will not be enough to agglutinate the RBCs and that is how you are going to see a smooth RBC button. Now you have a sample 1 and sample 2. So in the sample 1 what you see is that it is actually free of viruses because it is not showing a hemagglutination assay. The RBC buttons are present from the first well itself. Okay. Whereas in the sample number 2 you have the agglutination reaction, the hazy pattern here, the hazy pattern here and the hazy pattern here. But in the from the 1 is to 8 you are actually started getting the RBC button which indicate that the uh, the uh, the virus has the uh, has the uh, titer of 1 is to 8 in the sample 2 whereas the negative control is showing you the RBC button from the top to bottom. So what you see is that the hemocrylation titer of the positive control is the 32 or the 2 to power 5 whereas the no virus was observed in sample 1 therefore it has the 0 HA unit and the HA titer of the sample 2 is 4 or the 2 to power 2 actually or uh, in 50 microliters. So this is actually going to tell you that which sample is having the more amount of virus and which sample has the lower amount of viruses and you can be able to quantitate the number of viruses present in each sample and this is a very useful uh, assay to detect the virus in a particular sample and as well as you can be able to quantitate the level of viruses present in that particular solution. Now let us come back to the, uh, the antibody and the interactions. So, so far we have discussed about the insoluble antigens and we have discussed about the agglutination reactions in which we have also discussed about the hemagglutination and within the agglutination we have discussed about the direct as well as the indirect agglutination reactions. Now let us discuss about the soluble antigens. So once, you, the, once the antigen is soluble it is actually going to form the precipitate by interacting with the antibodies and within the precipitation reactions you have the two assays like radial immunodiffusion assay as well as the immunoprecipitations to, uh, to study the interaction between the antigen as well as the antibodies. So precipitation reactions. The, the reaction of a soluble antigen with the IgG or the IgM antibodies to form a large interlocking aggregates is called as the precipitation reactions. The precipitation reactions are formed by the antibodies are known as the precipitants. So the precipitate what is being formed by the antibodies are known as the precipitants it occurs in two stages. So the antigen antibody interaction is actually occurs in two stages to form the precipitate. 
in the stage 1 it actually is a rapid reaction where as soon as you add the antibodies to the antigen there will be a rapid interaction within a second between the antigen and antibody to form the antigen antibody complex. Once this rapid interaction occurs and the antigen and antibody are forming a stable complex then they proceed to the stage 2 where there will be a slow rate of reaction completing even within a few minutes or hours and forming a lattice from the antigen antibody complex which means now in the stage 2 which is actually a slow reaction all these antigen antibody complexes are going to form a clump or the lattice and by doing so the, these uh, these uh, uh, complexes are going to be so heavy that they are actually not going to be soluble into the uh, into the aqueous media and that is how they will actually going to be removed or they are actually going to form a particulate matter which is actually can be visible with the naked eye. Mismatch of the antibodies and antibody antigen ratio. So, what is very important for a uh, antigen antibody complex or antigen antibodies to form the precipitate is that you are supposed to provide the adequate amount of antigen as well as the antibodies. Because if there will be a mismatch between the antigen or the antibody, if you have too low antigen or too high antigen, the antibodies are not going to form the optimal precipitate and that is how it is important that you should add them in a particular ratio to observe the optimal precipitates. No visible precipitates is formed if you have the inadequate ratio of antigen and antibody. Now, the first experiment what we are going to discuss is the immunodiffusion assays or immunodiffusion test. The immunodiffusion tests are performed in a jelly agar media. One of the immunodiffusion assay is called as the octurnally test. In the octurnally test, wells are cut. So, you, you have a agarose block and in this agarose block what you are going to do is you are going to cut the well and these wells are going to contain the antigen or the antibodies and then you are going to add the antibodies or the antigen into these well and what will happen is that the antigen is actually going to diffuse out from these wells in all the directions. Okay. Similarly, you can imagine that antigen 2 is also is diffusing into this and the antibody is also diffusing into the agar and what will happen is well when they are diffusing they actually are going to meet with each other and that is how they at their meeting point these two are actually going to form the precipitate. So, what you see is that in this particular case the antigen 1 and as well as the antigen 2 are actually forming a continuous precipitate which means the antigen 1 and as well as the antigen 2 are actually are identical to each other and they are similar to each other that is why they are actually showing the, uh, the visible precipitate and they are actually forming a continuous precipitate when next to the antibodies. So, thereafter a line of visible precipitate is formed between the well where after diffusion optimal ratio of antigen and antibody is formed. So, antigen and ant antibody is going to have a very high concentration here, but when it diffusing its concentration is diluting. Similarly, when the antigen is diffusing it is also uh, concentration is very high next to the well, but when it is diffusing and that is how you are actually going to achieve a optimal antigen antibody concentrations to see the visible precipitate. Now, the next is radial immunodiffusion assay. Radial immunodiffusion assay is a quantitative immunodiffusion assay technique used to detect the concentration of an antigen by measuring the diameter of the precipitin ring formed by the interaction of the antigen and the antibody at a optimal concentration. In this method, the antibody is incorporated into agarose gel whereas the antigen diffuses into it in a radial pattern. Thus, the antibody is uniformly distributed throughout the gel. So, compared to the uh, immunodiffusion assays, 
in this one what you are doing is you are simply taking a agarose block and you are actually adding the antibodies into that this means the agarose block is going to have the homogeneous concentration of the antibodies so you have an agarose block which actually contains the antibodies in a homogeneous concentration so compared to the radial immunoassays in this one you are actually having in, in compared to the immunodiffusion assays in this one you are actually having the constant concentration of the antibodies throughout the agarose block and then what you do is you are actually going to cut a well and then you are actually going to add the antigen into that uh, once you add the antigen the antigen is going to diffuse and it is actually going to achieve at, at a particular con uh, concentration it is actually going to keep interacting with the antibody which is present into this agarose block and then it is start making the precipitate depending on how much antigen you are having in this particular well it is actually going to give you a, a ring of precipitin uh, a, a proportional to the concentration of the antigen what you have added into the well. The diameter of the precipitant ring is proportional to the concentration of the antigen. With increasing concentration of the antigen, the precipitant ring with the with will be a larger diameter are formed. The size of the precipitant ring will depend on the following four factors. Number one, it is actually going to be present on to the antigen concentration what you are taking into the sample well. Number two, it also depends on to the agarose. Uh, antibody concentration what you are taking into this particular uh, agarose block because if the antibody is going to be the limiting factor then the antigen is not going to be sufficient enough if the antibody is limiting then the antigen even if the antigen is more the precipitant ring will be proportional to the the concentration of the antibody then you it will also depend on the size of the sample well so because uh, the amount of the well what you are going to take the diffusion will start from there so the the size of the precipitant ring also will be in proportion to that and then the volume of the sample is also very important to see the uh, the diameter of the precipitant ring how to perform this assay uh, the so thus the standard curve can be obtained from which one can determine the amount of antigen in a unknown concentration. For example, you can actually do the, uh, the unknown sample of different concentrations. So, you can do uh, antigen of different amount and that actually is going to give you the precipitant ring of different diameter. So, what you can do is you can simply plot the diameters of these, uh, these rings on the y axis and you can actually plot the concentration of the antigen onto the x axis and then what you can do is you can just simply use the unknown concentration and you can be able to determine the concentration of that particular antigen. If the more than one ring appear in the test, for example, if you have the two rings like this, then that actually implies that you have more than one antigen present into your reaction mixture which means these antigen are actually having the differential and reactions with the antibodies this could be this could be the mixture of antigen or the antibody so this could be because you whatever the antibody you are adding is not pure so it is actually having the two different antibodies and that do these two different antibodies have the different types of interaction with the antigen and because of that you are actually getting the two rings one ring which is for the antibody one the other ring which is for the antibody two or in other case you have the single antibody but you have two antigens which are also having the interaction with the antibody so the smaller ring you are getting for the antigen one according to its concentration and the larger ring you are getting for the antigen antigen two which is also according to its particular concentration this test is commonly used in the clinical laboratories for the determination of immunoglobulin label into the patients. So, with these radial immunoassays, you can actually be able to determine the uh, antigens, you can be able to determine the antibodies because it is actually going to give you the ring of precipitant. So, you can actually be able to detect or you can be able to uh, diagnose the presence of the antibody in the sample or the presence of the antigen. 
Now let's see how to perform this assay and whatever the material you are required. The material what you required is the glassware like conical flask, mixing cylinder and beaker, reagents you require uh, agarose so that you will be able to prepare the agarose block, then you require the assay buffer, then you require the standard antigens, then you require the tenth test antigens, glass plate, gel punctures and the distilled water and alcohol. The equipment what you require is an incubator, the 37 degree Celsius incubator, a microwave or the burner so that you will be able to prepare the uh, agros block. Then you require a matisse mixture, spatula, micropipette and all these kind of minor items. Uh, for the procedures, first you have to prepare a 10 ml of 1% agros gel. So, uh, you can actually just weigh the amount of agaros what you require and then you put it into the 10 ml of the PPS. Then you take out the 6 ml of this gel solution is a, in a test tube, allow the solution to cool down to 55 to 60 degrees Celsius. This, this is a very important step that you should allow this solution to cool down so that when you add the antibodies to this solution, antibodies should not get denatured and add the 80 microliter of anti serum to 6 ml of agro solutions mix well for uniform distribution of the antibodies then you pour the agro solutions containing the antacera on a non greasy grease free glass plate placed on the horizontal surface allow the gel to settle for 30 minutes which means you are going to take a glass block and this glass block should not have the grease because the glass are coming where you have a shiny coating. So, if you have a shiny coating this agarose block will not going to stick to that. So, what you need is a glass which does not have the shiny coating and it should be rough actually so that it should be able to hold the agarose block. Then you are actually going to pour the agarose onto this and then you let it let the agarose to be solidified. Once the agarose is solidified then you are actually going to punch the wells with the help of a gel puncher uh, which actually is going to you know just you have to make the holes so that you will be able to load the antigens into this. Uh, use gel tins once you have done the hole you can remove this agarose block so that there will be a well to load the samples. Then you can add the 10 microliter of the standard antigen and the test antigen into the well and then you incubate this glass plate into a moist chamber because if you allow the water to evaporate from this the agarose is not going to be remain as a thin sheet. So, you have to stop the uh, evaporation of the water. So, what you can do is just simply add some tissue which is wet tissue into the water so that it should keep the uh, moisture content intact within this chamber. Now, just incubate it for the overnight and then you are going to see the results. Then you observe the precipitant ring around the antigen well, mark the edges of the precipitant ring and measure the diameter. So, what you are going to see is, see for example, this is the well and what you are going to see is a precipitant ring around this. Similarly, this is the another antigen, it is going to see the precipitant ring. So, what you are going to do is just outline this uh, ring and then you are going to determine the diameter of this particular precipitant ring and what you are going to observe is that the against the concentration you have to note down the diameter and then you can also note down the diameter for the uh, test samples. Then what you are going to do is you plot these. Uh, in a in a curve and you can be able to use that curve for calculating the concentration of the antigen in a unknown samples. While you are performing this assay you might have to uh, you might face the different types of problems and that is how you actually can do the troubleshooting as well. What is the problem? You may not see a precipitation ring form. In that case you might have not done the inadequate, inadequate filling of the wells or you can be able to the, the incubate the agro gel got dried up while you were doing the incubation. So, while while it will get dried up it is actually going to affect the diffusion of the antigen and that is how it is actually not going to give you the precipitant rings. When you were actually adding the anti sera into the agros, the agros temperature was not 55 to 60, but it was slightly higher and that is how the antibodies got inactivated. Uh, if you 
want to solve this problem what you have to do is you have to fill the adequate amount of the uh, solutions into the well you you have to ensure that there is enough moisturizer in the chamber and then you also have to ensure that the agarose got cooled down uh, to enough so that the antisera is not going to be inactivated sometime what you are going to also observe is the blur precipitant ring which means the precipitant ring is not going to be very uh, very clear cut it is actually going to be uh, hazy in that case you might the first reason is that it might be because of the inactivation of the serum or it could be because of the uneven pouring of the gel which means your gel thickness is uneven which means it is not going to form the very smooth surface and because of that it is actually showing a blurry precipitant ring you can simply uh, solve this problem either by ensure that the antisera is not been inactivated and the agarose is completely cooled down before you uh, pour it into the glass plate and then uh, you can also place the glass plate on a flat surface while pouring the gel so that there will be no uneven pouring of the agarose onto the this glass plates so this is all about the radial immunodiffusion assays where we have discussed each and every detail of the protocols let's move on to the next uh, slide the next is the immunoelectrophoresis the principle of the immunoelectrophoresis is based on the movement of the antigen and antibodies to the opposite pole after applying the electric current if the reaction occurs you will see a precipitation line so so far what we were doing is we were simply relying on to the diffusion of the antigen or the antibodies and in that case you are going to observe a precipitation ring or precipitation line but sometime the antigen or the antibody what you are handling are very big and they are their their diffusion rate is very slow because of that it is not possible for these antigens to be tested in a radial immunoassay or the immuno uh, elect, uh, immunodiffusion assays so in that cases what you do is you simply uh, make a, a, a agarose gel and in that case you just uh, you know uh, pour the ag agarose uh, pour the antigen into one well and the antibodies into another well and then you apply the electric current across them so what will happen is the antigen and antibodies are going to run in a opposite direction and then while they are running they will interact with each other and that's how they will actually going to form the precipitate so what you are going to do is you are just simply going to add the antigen into one of the well antibodies into another well and then you are going to apply the electric field so once you apply the electric fields the antigen will run into this direction the antibody will run into this direction and when they will meet at the the center point you are going to see a precipitation line so and that precipitation line is going to be uh, tell you that this antigen and this antibody are interacting with each other and this is this kind of assay is used for for the diagnosis of the bacterial meningitis and the other diseases so this is all about the studying the interaction of the antigen and antibody so far we discussed about the agglutination reactions we discussed about the precipitation reactions and in the precipitation reactions just we have discussed about the radial immunoassays so with this i would like to conclude my lecture here in the subsequent lectures we are actually going to discuss about the uh, immunoprecipitation reactions and then we are going to take up the immunoassays to discuss how to perform the immunoassays and how you can be able to use them for uh, answering the some of the biological questions so with this i would like to conclude my lecture here thank you